I got to tell you, it's so good to be home. And 10 years ago today, I was really on this traditional MBA path. I had done the management consulting, came to Haas for the full-time program, graduated, got married the month after, and started the MBA leadership rotational program here in Silicon Valley. Except, well, about four months after I started my new job, I got pregnant. Parents in the room? You know how it is. No matter how much you feel like you're mentally prepared, uh-uh, not gonna cut it. So I entirely underestimated the emotional toll. And life seems to have its sense of humor because we got pregnant again, but this time with twins. <laughs> and so at one point I had three under three, all in diapers, kicking, screaming, and crying, and I'm not talking about the kids, me that I knew something's got to change. I got to figure out this parenting situation else I will not emotionally survive. So I did what I do best. I became an ethnographer. And in business terms, it means fake it till you make it. So somehow I convinced my way into becoming the director of the Montessori preschool that my three children are going to be attending. And I gotta tell you, like Kelly mentioned, there's something vaguely familiar with transitioning as an executive coach of VPs from Fortune 500 companies into this workplace for little people. Something familiar but entirely frightening. But it was cool because I was like, oh my gosh, you know, forget the TMZ. I've got my daily dose of parenting juice. I get to know and learn how other parents do it. I get to hear what teachers really think of my children and other parents, right? I'm going to learn a lot. And if I could sum up my experience with one image, this is it. It turns out that nobody had the answers. In fact, we were all frantically trying to answer three questions. What's the right thing to do? Am I doing enough or am I scarring my child, right? So unfortunately, my quest for this parenting thing continues. And this time around, I've decided, you know what? I'm going to learn from the best of the best when it comes to education. So I applied and got into the Harvard Graduate School of Education in an interdisciplinary program in developmental cognitive neuroscience and education. And it was really there I surrounded myself in and out of the classrooms with researchers, scientists, educators, top notch of the world to understand what it is. And I saw myself in this role as the Tomb Raider. I wanted to smuggle out these golden nuggets of conversations and wisdoms I was having outside of the ivory tower to make it accessible for all. But the problem was, I didn't know how to transport them, right? In a format that really honors what parents need and what children need in a doable, usable, actionable way today. So interestingly, a couple of things sort of converged together around this time. So parents out there, right? What's the number one advice you get when you ask your pediatricians or teachers on what I can do at home? Exactly, read to your child, number one advice, right? So it turns out that this recent research came out of Harvard, MIT, actually sort of debunks it a little bit. And here's what it says, right? It's not merely dumping of the words to your child, meaning lecturing at your child, that really facilitates the development, but rather it's the magical, serve and return conversations that you build through the social and emotional connections that neurobiologically develops the child's brain, this reciprocity. So in that, around that time, I also had conversations, unfortunately, with a couple of friends who were dealing with cancer. And I started thinking for myself, right, for my three young children, God forbid if something happens to me, right, what are the wisdoms and memories that I like to leave with my children? And rest in peace knowing that they're set for life. And so these couple of things would have emerged. I started to continue to interview with my colleagues from around the world, practitioners, educators, researchers, again, on well, what made you who you are today? And what are the most important things you see in the classroom, outside of the classroom, that really creates these life skills for our children? And that is when I created 52 Essential Conversations and Relationships. And these are really sort of facilitating the gaps that where I found through my research that 
parents want to talk about these things, right? But it's the skills, language, and confidence that is really the gap where, you know, in the busyness of our day, we only have 30 minutes to an hour with our loved one, this quality time, but it never quite turned out to be that way, right? So how do we do that? And so this is my solution, the culmination of my research. And I have to say, I'll let you in on a little secret. It's not just for children, but it's especially for adults. And in fact, it is now used, uh, as Kelly mentioned, in over 30 countries, all 50 states. Interestingly, not just homes, but also schools and workplaces. So I want to end with something else. You know how I mentioned life has a sense of humor? So the reason of what is it that I do, I do, actually happened here at the Anderson Auditorium. I want to remember my beloved professor, Bill Sunshine, if you guys had him. Uh, he taught me what authenticity means in leadership and especially in life. So today, I want to take this opportunity to remind you and encourage you to really think what being an authentic person, having the authentic uh, relationship and conversation means to you. And so that you can have these connections, not merely from the position of a parent, a partner, a boss, or coworker, but truly from the position of an authentic human being from one dignity to another. Thank you.